I will kick it off. So good evening. My name is Robert Nash. I'm the president of the Winnipeg branch of the Canadian International Council. <clears throat> and I want to welcome you to the second of our events that highlights the work of the CIC fellows. These individuals hold a position with the CIC for a 12 month period. And uh, it's been a while since we've had any fellows with the CIC. So the current uh, crop of six CIC fellows is, uh, is, uh, is doing good work for us. And we're quite pleased with, uh, to have them on the team. I am going to this event. Uh, I gotta find my slide here. Uh, this event highlights the work of three of our fellows, and we're going to talk about a, it's a broad ranging uh, discussion this evening that we're anticipating, talking about the pandemic, inequalities, human rights, and nation states, and how those things all intersect in a world, a globalized world. And uh, our moderator this evening will be Marina Sharp, who's a professor of international studies at the Royal Military College in St. John, Quebec. So Without further ado, I'm going to turn, well, sorry, before I turn it over to, to Marina, I would ask that the visitors, the guests who aren't speaking tonight, uh, mute their cameras, mute their mics and uh, turn off their cameras, and we will uh, give you an opportunity to interact with the speakers uh, during the Q&A session. Uh, by fortuitous, hopefully, accident. Uh, we've uh, created this event this evening as a meeting rather than a webinar, which means that everybody's involved all the time. It means that people can, uh, can chat with each other uh, in the background, and it also means that the uh, our, our guests can be more engaged with the speakers during the Q&A period. That'll probably create nightmares for Marina, but I'm sure we'll figure it out and get through. If you want to ask a question of one of the speakers, I'd ask that you please send it to Marina and let Marina stick handle how she wants to uh, address them. She'll either invite you to ask your question yourself or she'll ask it on your behalf. And if you have any other if you have any questions about how we're doing business, you can ask me or the CIC, or actually the, either of the CIC communications uh, connections and we'll uh, help you out. So without any further ado, Marina, I'll turn the floor over to you. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Robert had mentioned um, putting the questions in the chat, but I actually think that since we're such a small group, um, it would be better to, to ask them out loud. And, and also the chat can be, I would actually like to listen to the talks, so then the chat can be a bit distracting. So if you don't mind, um, We'll have questions at the end and you can at the end if you turn your cameras on and you can just ask your questions out loud uh, and i'm going to do them one at a time rather than bundling them just because you know it's a small group um so why not make it more of of uh, a dialogue um so i'm going to introduce the speakers and the titles of their talks in the order that they are going to speak um and then i'll hand it over to them and they're each going to speak for uh, between 10 and 12 minutes um, and then we'll have about half an hour for questions at the end. So our first speaker is Elizabeth Vallet. She's associate professor um, and my colleague at the Royal Military College Saint-Jean, and also the director of the Center for Geopolitical Studies at the Raoul Dandurand Chair in Strategic and Diplomatic Studies at the Université de Québec à Montréal. She's also the Quebec lead for the University of Victoria's Borders in Globalization Program and a regular columnist for um, Radio-Canada and for the newspaper Le Devoir. She has been the recipient of the Richard Morrill Outreach Award from the American Association of Geographers um, Political Geography Specialty Group. Her current research focuses on borders and globalization, border walls and governance. And she's gonna speak to us on borders and the pandemic. Our second speaker is Rujan Habibi. She's a lawyer, a consultant, and a doctoral student at Osgoode Hall Law School of York University. Um, in addition to being a fellow with the CIC, she's also a fellow of the Global Strategy Lab. Her scholarship bridges the disciplines of law, human rights, and global health. 
and she actively teaches, teaches and provides research supervision and mentorship to students who are passionate about global health equity. She holds a JD from the University of Ottawa with a specialization in transnational law um, from the University of Geneva and a master's in global health from McMaster. And she is going to speak to us about global vaccine inequity, international law, and the race to vaccinate populations. And our last speaker will be Alejandro Reyes, who is Associate Professor and Director of Knowledge Dissemination at the Asia Global Institute, which is a think tank of the University of Hong Kong. He, um, prior to joining the Institute, he was for two years Senior Policy Advisor to the Assistant Deputy Minister for Asia Pacific at Global Affairs Canada. He served in the department in 2002 as Senior Policy Advisor to the G8 policy team. Before his more recent stint in Ottawa, he was Associate Professor of Politics and Public Administration at Hong Kong University. And he's going to speak to us about globalization as global responsibility. So I will hand it uh, over to Elizabeth. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Marina. I am going to um, share my screen. Um, I think we, we need pictures at this time of the day, at least on our side of the world, um, and images. So um, speaking about borders, border walls and, and COVID, um, is it work? Yes. Um, I thought it interesting to go back in time and, and see that uh, any pandemic is by definition globalized. And, and it's interesting to go back. We, we've been working um, on that with my team. Uh, on the uh, the questions of uh, borders in a pandemic, and it was really interesting to go step back in time and see how uh, we have um, addressed um, the pandemic through the border, and and th thinking that we could close the border in order to to um, to stop the virus, which obviously, uh, as you can tell here through three waves, uh, hasn't worked. Um, we also found interesting, and we are working on that, trying to uh, see how borders were closed with uh, along the waves of the pandemic. And one thing, one footnote I should make here is that it, it's always scary to see how long the 1918 Spanish flu um, lingered in the world. And if we follow the same pattern, which we seem we do, we still have a year and a half to go in that type of world. Um, and, um, and as we were stepping back in time and trying to assess that uh, border response to the pandemic, it was interesting to go back to the, to the geography of the plague and how already at the time it was globalized, uh, coming all the way from Asia to um, in, in several waves uh, into, uh, into, the, uh, into Europe. And what was particularly interesting was looking in, at the specific um, case of the last uh, plague uh, pandemic in Europe, which began in 1720. And um, as the plague came in, and maybe I, I will just go shortly through the story. The, the plague was in the Eastern Mediterranean and uh, they, they, there was, they had uh, in the, the, the ports of the Mediterranean quite a, quite a good response to the pandemic. So they had um, methods in, in place uh, for, to quarantine and places and protocols that were uh, fairly followed. Um, but when in, uh, in, uh, in June 1720, one of those uh, boats arrived and there had been several uh, duptious uh, death uh, on the boat. Uh, they decided to quarantine the boat, but uh, they had some, um, how do you call them? The, Marina, I will need your help. The, the étoffes, the tissus, uh, comme des draps. Um, oh, I totally forgot the name. Um, Clothes, let's say, um, that, um, um, were uh, imported in order to be uh, sold in uh, in higher in in France, and because they didn't want to, they, they, because the, the the mayor at the time of Marseille really wanted to to make the economy rolling, and you, you see me coming because there are also similar similarities. He said that maybe those 
big drapes they had didn't need to be quarantined. And actually the plague entered the city with those uh, drapes and clothes that they brought in. And as they quickly detected the plague rolling into the city and as the death were uh, increasing fairly quickly, and as you can tell on the, on the graph on the left-hand side, um, they decided to quarantine, close the city. And there, had, there has been at the time a very big debate, a fierce debate between the advocates of the reopening the economy and those who wanted to maintain those quarantine. So if you look on the right hand side of the map, and that is uh, to me the most interesting um, nowadays, is that they chose at the time to uh, build a wall right there and a, a sanitary uh, zone here too. So the answer to the plague at the time was to build that wall that you see here uh, along the Conta Venessin, which was a small uh, part of Provence. And, uh, and this is called the wall of the plague. Of course, by the time the wall was finished, the plague had entered the uh, Europe and France was being uh, um, hit hardly by the plague. So those, that wall didn't work. Fast forward to today, um, you see here the, uh, the COVID border accountability project. What was very interesting to see from our point of view as border scholars uh, was the, the how quick, how fast those borders across the world, almost 93% of the uh, world's borders were closed in a matter of weeks. And some of them closed totally. Uh, most of the, of the population in, um, in, in the world were uh, caught in, in between borders uh, that, uh, that were thickly uh, closed. Um, so to us, what was kind of amazing is how fast those border, borders closed and how fast they, uh, they were able to, to seal certain borders. For instance, the one between Canada and the US had been um, after 9-11 closed for actually a few days really. And then it reopened gradually, but quite quickly. Whereas here we have a border that has never been totally closed, but he's still partially, uh, it's almost an asymmetry, asymmetrical membrane that filters most of the flows. And what's interesting, if we go into Canada, and that map has been uh, drawn by Alex McPhee at the University of Calgary, is that not only those were international borders, but also, also in turn, internal uh, to a lot of countries, that map he has drawn, um, I think the height of the, uh, the travel restrictions was April 18, 2020. And you see that there are inter-provincial inter borders, but also borders around the, uh, the, the, the First Nations uh, community, some of them being still closed as we speak. Um, we went on the north coast of Quebec this summer, and there were many places we used to be able to access uh, the Isipit, um, the Innu nation of Isipit, for instance, had sealed itself off the rest of the world. So um, not only borders have been uh, closed, but some new borders have appeared. And that translates in terms of inequalities. Um, because as before, and, and you know the passport is definitely um, a, a tool that in, with which we are not equal, uh, depending on the passport you hold, your mobility will be uh, increased or decreased. Um, and uh, there is all, also a palmarès of the best passports to hold because they allow you for further mobility. Um, so pre-pandemic, being able to be mobile and go from one place to another, um, it was a luxury that, that, that was a signal of inequality. So if you were able to travel first class around the world, your mobility was an indication of the, your wealth. Uh, what's interesting is during the pandemic, it has been exactly the opposite. Um, if you, and, and I work from home as a professor, so I have that luxury. So the inequality is, is that, that I can choose my immobility 
so I can stay home. Whereas somebody like some of the uh, migrant workers we've had here working um, night shifts in some of the uh, uh, old people's home uh, have not been able to choose their immobility, they are forced to be mobile uh, in a time where you would rather want to stay home. This will go also uh, with the uh, immunity passport or the, uh, the, the, the vaccine passport we may have to hold uh, at one point because here again, uh, depending on who has uh, emitted, um, uh, printed your passport, uh, this will have a certain value. We've seen already uh, when the Canadians were coming back from the Caribbean uh, at Christmas time, showing uh, their uh, the proof that they had been tested. And then quickly enough, we heard that some of those um, uh, Vax, uh, tests were counterfeit. Um, so we were doubting of the validity of those tests because they were not uh, printed or emitted by, by uh, a Western country. So there is a, an assessment of the value of the, the documents we hold depending on where they are uh, produced and emitted. And that translates um, um, in that picture to me. So. And I will just uh, slide to the border walls. So those borders closing um, during the pandemic, that movement of bordering didn't happen in a vacuum. It, uh, it's adding to a, um, a two, three decades uh, practice of uh, bordering and fortification. This picture is taken in the Gulf of Melilla. Uh, and Melilla is a small Spanish enclave uh, in Morocco. So we are here standing in the European Union facing Morocco and Maghreb. And the people you see on top of the fence are uh, people from um, the sub-Saharan uh, area trying to jump into the EU to be able to claim asylum. On the right hand side, you see a, um, a policeman from La Guardia Civil who is trying to literally make them fall on the wrong, uh, for them, wrong hand side of the wall. Um, and the, the, so that process of fortification that will probably be accelerated by the pandemic um, is the result of a, uh, a, a several decades of. Um, border wall building and what you see is um, the, 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 the number of walls that have been built around the world. Uh, we start here in 1990, there was one or two in 1945, so it was fairly, the increase was fairly constant until we reached uh, 2000 where it began to uh, increase very quickly all around the world. So no um, continent is exempt of that uh, border fortification trend that we uh, see everywhere, uh, as you can see on the, uh, on the map, with a few accelerations, one of them being, of course, in 2015. Um, that um, movement of fortification has translated in the militarization of the border, uh, which we have seen here um, in Nogales with Trump, but it has been seen elsewhere uh, with uh, the use of, um, of um, technologies that are sometimes not controlled. Um, the, um, the, um, the border is definitely a state uh, of exception, a, a place where uh, the law doesn't apply like, like it applies elsewhere. Um, that, by consequence, has also led to a, a change in the discourses. We're pretty far from the, the idea of the nation of immigrant of Kennedy, and we see more and more um, um, discourses around the idea that at the border there is a war and that was uh, that happened way uh, before Trump even entered power um, and border borders fortified borders do kill that's the uh, another um, mark of inequality uh, we do not cross the border the same way and those who cannot cross the border um, regularly um, have, uh, have a higher risk of dying along the way. And those are maps that have been realized, uh, drawn uh, around Europe or on the left-hand side between uh, Mexico and the US. And those inequalities uh, do translate also um, into um, 
um, sub inequalities, women are particularly hit by that uh, violence at the border. Um, and Susan Arbage Page, whom I work with, uh, she is a, um, a visual art professor at the University of Chapel Hill, and she does document what migrants leave behind them. And uh, uh, we've worked together on those rape trees that we uh, can sometimes encounter at the border of um, Texas, for instance. And that's where underwear are being hanged on the trees. Um, and the, um, people don't really know what it is, but we there are several hypotheses, one of them being um, it's a way to intimidate women to show them that the, the, those who don't obey go through that. It could be a way for, of bragging from the, the cartels. So there are many hypotheses, but it is really a visual manifestation of that violence that you may encounter at the border. On the left-hand side, um, those, this is the consequence of uh, razors that are put on top of those fences in Mirla, in Ceuta, and in some places in California. Those are designed to hurt. And uh, at the top, the little uh, live vest that you uh, see is one that we photographed with uh, Susan um, in the Rio Grande Valley. And it's a, a three-year-old uh, size, meaning that somebody has uh, had to cross uh, the, Rio Grande the, the Rio Grande, which is a fairly fierce uh, river. I've swam into it and I don't recommend it, um, but um, with, a, with, with a pretty young kid. So it's again, another mark of violence. So I'll stop at that. We may have uh, questions later, but that's about what I study uh, in, uh, in life. Thank you. Regine, I will hand you the mic. Sure. Thank you so much, um, uh, Elizabeth. And, and thank you, Marina, for the, int the, the introduction and for the moderation. Um, as well, thank you to Kasser, um, to Robert, and the CIC Winnipeg uh, for the opportunity. Um, I, you know, I, I think there's a lot to say about inequalities in this pandemic, but um, I thought I'd focus my talk on something that is a quite hot topic right now, and I know that a lot that it, it has hit the news a lot, so maybe some of what I'm not I'm, I'm about to talk about is not entirely new to everyone. Um, but I do think it's important to unpack a bit what we mean when we talk about the COVID-19 vaccination race, and to also think about who we're really up against. Um, Within one year, uh, the world has uh, managed to produce at least seven vaccines against this virus that causes COVID. <clears throat> and this is in no small part thanks to the cooperation in scientific research and collaboration in knowledge sharing that we've really seen happening at a global level during this pandemic, especially in the early stages. It's incredible and it's never been done before. And we should be very proud as, as a human race, as humanity for um, this achievement. Um, but the picture of the solidarity that we've, we, we managed to bring together against a common threat pretty much ends there um, because almost as soon as the vaccines emerged on the market, countries began bidding against one another to procure these newly discovered vaccines as swiftly as possible for their population. And so predictably, a handful of higher income countries have so far emerged on top. So according to Bloomberg, um, there are at least more than 550 million vaccine doses that have been administered in more than 150 countries, but this figure belies the great imbalance that we are now seeing in terms of which countries have a substantial portion of their population vaccinated and how many doses are getting to the population each and every single day. Only 10 economies account for 77% of the global doses that have been administered thus far. And when the administration of doses is seen on a map, um, it becomes all too clear that some places, especially the continent of Africa, are being left behind in the biggest vaccination drive we've seen in the world today. At this rate, the poorest countries in the world may not receive widespread vaccination until 2023, and that's largely contingent on the fact that booster doses won't even be needed. So we don't know to what extent vaccines are needed on a yearly basis, but so far, even the first doses but for widespread vaccination are, are, are looking like a couple years down the line for the poorest economies. The COVID-19 uh, Vaccine Global Access Facility, also known as COVAX, is the international mechanism that we have today. Um, it was intended, among other things, to distribute doses to countries that lack supply. Um, and it was established last year as part of international efforts to overcome the pandemic. 
Um, so COVAX, the way the idea of COVAX was initially uh, could promising. It sought to consolidate vaccine procurement plans from around the world into a common financing system. What that common financing system would have done is allow for COVAX members to, uh, to have stronger bargaining power vis-a-vis -vis the pharmaceutical manufacturers, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, the, the vaccine developers, and to be able to essentially negotiate prices that would be fair to all and that would allow for distribution of vaccines to all. Ultimately, the goal of COVAX was still ambitious, but not ambitious enough, some would say, and that is the goal of distributing vaccines to at least 20% of the population in low and middle income countries. So still not the whole population, far from it, but still we are having trouble reaching even that. Um, so COVAX has delivered about 40 million doses to 100 countries or so, um, but it could have done so much more. And it didn't do that because wealthy countries began cutting to the front of the queue and negotiating their own deals with pharmaceutical companies with uh, higher prices and paying more than what COVAX was offering. The move crippled the world's bargaining power with vaccine makers. And it has allegedly also exposed certain countries in the global South to what some government officials in the global South have called as high level bullying, quote unquote, as they negotiate unfair contracts with vaccine manufacturers. This has also undermined global solidarity for the pandemic recovery at a time that it was needed the most. So while COVAX continues to receive a stream of piecemeal financing commitments, it also remains um, beset by shortfalls in funding and delays in the rollout of doses. But even in, in a bewildering way, some countries that have procured, procured enough doses to vaccinate their entire population several times over, aka Canada, have even opted to take millions of doses out of the global distribution mechanism, leaving fewer jabs available for countries that are entirely reliant on COVAX. This move would have been understandable had all countries of the world really paid into COVAX the way it was supposed to be. But under current conditions where we have a bunch of 10, uh, 10 or so rich countries who have cut in front of the line and negotiated their own bilateral deals, um, the move doesn't seem very fair. Now, the ability of countries to procure vaccines outside of the COVAX facility is also deeply determined by the rules of intellectual property law, and in particular by the World Trade Organization's TRIPS agreement. And what the TRIPS agreement does is essentially it issues a 20-year pharmaceutical patent um, that monopolizes the ability to manufacture drugs to the vaccine maker or to the, therap or to the, the holder of other therapeutic patents. Um, over 100 countries left who were led by South Africa and India have called for a temporary waiver of these intellectual property laws until, until the end of the crisis. Um, if the waiver were in place, we could potentially scale up the number of, <clears throat> excuse me, a number of plants producing vaccines. And at the moment, the vaccines manufactured for poorer countries are being manufactured almost exclusively in India's Serum Institute. And that is because AstraZeneca, that's the manufacturer that AstraZeneca licensed to do the vaccine for, to produce the vaccine for it. This short-sightedness short -sightedness of this reliance on the goodwill of manufacturers is now being acutely felt uh, sorry, felt as India has ordered the Serum Institute to prioritize vaccinating the Indian population first. Also understandable. Um, the WHO Director General has called this lack of cooperation across nations a catastrophic moral failure. And there are at least a couple reasons why he's right. The most obvious and apparent reason that we should all worry about is that inequality is the va that vaccine inequality gives essentially breathing room to more dangerous and more transmissible variants of this COVID-19 virus to develop. These, vi these variants, the ones that we're seeing now today, are spreading like wildfire. They're highly transmissible, they're potentially more lethal, and they have the potential to captivate an entire population within months or within weeks. And while borders have remained watertight in many countries, inevitably, some spread does occur, um, especially in localities where public health measures have, be, uh, have become complacent or where, where they're not as stringent or where, again, this debate between the health and the economy resurfaces and it'll, it, 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 it creates room for some governments to, to ease up restrictions in the defense of businesses and other, um, uh, other, other stakeholders who, wanna, who have a stake in seeing the, vac uh, the, the restrictions to um, weaken. Um, the newly appointed head of the World Trade Organization 
has explained that ongoing mutations of the virus mean that no country can feel safe until every country has taken precautions. And so variants will continue to spawn so long as this virus is circulating unchecked in any part of the world. And vaccine resistant variants are a near term possibility. And so we'd have to go back to square one again and try to find new vaccines. The second consequence is the, of, of these of vaccine inequality is that it also means that um, the global economy will take much longer to recover. And the third consequence is that it has paved the way towards unproductive manifestations of vaccine diplomacy in our already pro, uh, polarized world. Now, vaccine diplomacy isn't a new phenomenon, and some have some have even said that it can be a force for good in the world. And so, just by way of example, before the 1800s. Edward Jenner, who was a British doctor, published his research on the use of the cowpox virus, known as vaccinia, to inoculate humans against smallpox virus. The smallpox vi vaccine not only entered into widespread use in England, but it was so successful that it led, um, that it was also shared with France, and even as there was ongoing war between England and France. So the vaccine was so successful that it led Napoleon to mandate the establishment of vaccine departments in major cities of France, of the French Empire. And Jenner was eventually elected to be a foreign member of the Institute of France. And later in a letter, he remarked that science, um, that science, that the sciences are never at war. The manifestations of vaccine diplomacy, though, that we are seeing today are, are, are seem to be ones in which vaccines have become tools for soft power. And some Western leaders are even acknowledging their failure to exert influence through the donation or through the distribution of vaccines as um, as, as, an, as a motive to distribute vaccines. And I would, I would argue that uh, anchoring vaccine distribution on that power play uh, is, is, not, uh, is not what we should be doing or what we should be thinking about primarily. What I think fundamentally should concern us all is the ways in which the vaccine will redraw borders as uh, Elizabeth has mentioned uh, and redraw the world map as governments that manage to successfully vaccinate their populations, selectively only allow vaccinated travelers to enter their countries. And in some cases, only travelers who are vaccinated even with specific vaccines. This is already happening in countries like China, which have reportedly said, and perhaps, perhaps uh, Alejandra has better insight into this, but I'm basing it on reports that it will facilitate the processing of visas for travelers who have received Chinese manufactured vaccines. And we know that if many, if not all country vaccinations have not prioritized the most vulnerable beyond certain key groups. So we know, for instance, that the elderly are prioritized. We know that our healthcare workers are generally prioritized, but beyond that, it's hard to know which groups are, it's, it's hard to imagine um, a vaccine distribution plan that has equitably prioritized the most vulnerable other than the elderly and, and healthcare workers. And what this means is that at least for the foreseeable future, vulnerable populations, both in high income countries and in lower and middle income countries, will have their freedom of movement and other fundamental human rights curtailed with no near term resolution in sight if vaccine distribution is not achieved globally. And so in a recent letter to asking contributors to step up for a, uh, for a campaign on vaccine equity, which the WHO is spearheading, um, the Director General noted whether it's dose sharing, whether it's technology transfer, voluntary licensing, waiving intellectual property rights, we just need to pull out all the stops. This COVID vaccination race isn't going to be about vaccinating the population of just one country quickly enough. It's about vaccinating all countries of people of all countries as soon as possible. And that's really the only way to end this economic and health crisis. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Alejandro. Thank you so much. Great, thank you very much, Virginia. Um, uh, good, e good evening, everybody. It's uh, it's morning here in Hong Kong, um, but uh, I, I um, it's um, it's great to be here. Thank you very much to the CIC uh, folks and to all colleagues, and uh, thank you very much, um, Elizabeth and uh, Regine, for your presentations. With reference to what Regine mentioned, um, yes, uh, China had said that um, they would. Uh, recognize um, any uh, for purposes of travel entry into into um, uh, China getting a visa uh, they would only recognize uh, the China produced vaccines but I believe in recent weeks that 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 has position has changed and there is now discussion about um, 
uh, recognizing uh, other vaccines. Anyway, uh, let, let me uh, uh, talk a bit about globalization as global responsibility um, and uh, using this pandemic as, um, as really the, a starting point. The pandemic in many ways has been a, a truly global event, it, 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 arguably more so than the recent global financial crisis that um, erupted in um, 2008. It, it underscores, I think, that globalization as a, as a phenomenon, as a process is A, unstoppable, B, it's, un, it's volatile, uh, the changes, uh, the pace of globalization is happening at really varying speeds with both positive, negative, and mixed um, effects. And that C, globalization as a kind of force, um, ideally should drive greater competitiveness and resilience. In other words, as, we, as globalization plays out, ideally the reaction of nation states that are affected, economies that are affected, is that then they should improve um, the way in which you know, uh, their economy runs or how competitive they are, or indeed how well they uh, cooperate with countries in the region or countries around the world. Um, we should think in some ways about globalization, uh, about the pandemic as, uh, now I'm going to, I'm going to uh, refer to something that Andrew Cuomo has said, it may not be so popular these days as, as a source, but um, uh, Governor Cuomo talked about thinking of the pandemic as a tide that's uh, rolled out, exposing what's sort of normally hidden under below the surface. So we see more of the faults uh, that we have, the problems that we have, the challenges that we have when the tide is out. And uh, this is the time to clean up, as it were, uh, to try to deal with those uh, structural problems before the tide comes back, covers everything up, and then we can we, you know, we go on with our lives. So let me talk a little bit about what I mean about globalization as global responsibility. Um, it, it really started with my learning about uh, the responsibility to protect. And I won't go into the history of R2P and all of that. I know, of course, Canada is one of the um, uh, leading countries with respect to the adopting of R2P as a norm in international relations. Uh, but it, uh, it started in, uh, some years ago with a cyclone in, uh, in Myanmar. There was a, a cyclone Nargis that was uh, going to attack, uh, uh, hit Myanmar. And uh, it was quite devastating. And there were calls then because uh, the Myanmar government um, was preventing uh, international human uh, humanitarian responders to to enter the country or to help uh, its citizens. It was saying, well, we can handle it ourselves. And at that point, it was uh, clear that they could not. And um, one of the uh, leading, I guess, thought leaders on, on R2P, on the responsibility to protect, uh, Bernard Kushner, uh, who is the founder of Médecins Sans Frontières, um, he said, oh, you know, this is a, a time when the world should apply R2P, even though R2P as, as applied, as adopted in the United Nations, it were very specific circumstances and a disaster relating to a cyclone was, was certainly not one of them. Now, the, just to, to make the story a bit short, um, you know, R2P came about in large part because uh, there was a, 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 a changing, a, a change in the concept of sovereignty that Kofi Annan suggested that um, sovereignty should not necessarily be all about uh, a, a country or government uh, governing or having rule over people, but that there are responsibilities that the government has to protect um, its citizens, uh, keep them uh, away from harm. So with a nod to R2P, I was thinking, you know, when, 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 when thinking about the episode with Cyclone Nargis, it's you know, the idea that could you expand uh, R2P to consider disasters that 
are being ignored, say environmental disasters, or in this case, sort of natural disasters that a country can't handle. And because of their uh, unwillingness to let, um, uh, to allow uh, international humanitarian responders to enter the country that uh, somehow that then they were um, derelict in their responsibility to their people. So I started to think about uh, this and I, I, and I kind of came up uh, a few years ago with this idea of uh, the responsibility to connect, uh, which I'm calling R2C, an obligation on the part of a government to connect its citizens to the world, to participate in global initiatives and abide by fairly negotiated norms because doing these things, being open to uh, globalization, if you will, doing these things would in fact be in the national interest and congruent with the need to ensure that the country and its people are ready for the future or are able to deal with uh, environmental disasters or natural disasters. So too often, I think, governments separate uh, global and national interests as if somehow they are incompatible or that one should take precedence over the other, you know, America first, as it were. Um, meeting global responsibilities, I think, however, should must be regarded as a critical national responsibility and uh, not uh, an imposition that somehow nullifies uh, state sovereignty. So the platform for this connecting, as it were, is the international order or the international operating system, as I like to think about it. I'm trying to sort of apply some of the sort of uh, the model of an uh, operating system, um, uh, uh, computer operating system to the idea of the international order. We often refer to the rules-based international order, which is currently widely regarded as being in some state of disrepair. You know, but the, you know, in my view, the the order itself, you know, cannot die. I mean, cannot uh, disappear. It cannot uh, self-destruct. There's always some kind of order in the world. You know, the idea of G0 in some ways this sort of a chaotic world is, is I think somewhat, um, it, it, well, it's nonsense in my view, because I think there's always be some kind of order happening, even if it is uh, chaotic. It doesn't mean that um, there is no, or it seems chaotic, it doesn't mean that there isn't some kind of international order at work. In fact, uh, if anything, um, there are many different kinds of um, orders in the world operating at the same time. Now, it's not just about the liberal rules-based international order as uh, some in the West look at it. It's not just about that. It's not about, there are many, there have always been many different kinds of orders. Yeah? Think of it as, as different operating systems uh, uh, at the same time. You can have Android, you can have um, uh, 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 all, all these different um, uh, uh, versions. You have Apple system, the Mac OS, whatever. And there are different patches, different uh, uh, strains of it. Some are, have been corrupted and all that sort of thing, but there they're, they're are different orders that are sort of running the world. At the moment, I think when we think about the rules-based international order, we think about the, 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 the real uh, disrupt, disruptive factors that um, uh, right now in, in geopolitics that are creating this deterioration that people see in, in the um, international order. So the heightened US-China competition, the geopolitical direction of the United States under Trump was uh, highly disruptive. And of course, now people, of course, very much focused on the geopolitical direction of China as a kind of being sort of disruptive factors. As for the liberal rules-based international order, which, uh, you know, how liberal really was it? I mean, it was underpinned by guiding principles or values, including open markets, democracy, and the rule of law, cooperation among nations to address global problems and multilateral institutions, and American leadership in concert with uh, its mainly Western allies. Uh, you know, Trump was, was not a fan of, of, of this liberal rules-based international uh, order, and he campaigned against it, and he clearly uh, won the presidency in part because many Americans agreed with him that the international system and that liberal rules-based international order was somewhat broken or uh, impeded. And um, 
and, and they agreed with his analysis that many other countries have been t using these, uh, the institutions in that order um, to take advantage of the United States. And, 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 and I, you know, I won't go into the WTO and all of that sort of thing. But um, in, in my view, um, you know, if we look at efforts that were taken by other countries, including Canada, uh, to deal with that sort of disruption that was brought about by Trump, that, that clearly all is not lost in creating this international order, in, in, in shoring up this international order. I mean, I just would mention, say, the uh, revival of the TPP to create the CPTPP, the dispute resolution workaround in the WTO, that um, there are clearly forces that want to um, maintain um, uh, the order, that uh, uninternational order, and, and make it work. And I think this is really the chance uh, to do so. I think um, the pandemic as such has exposed the weakness of existing order, and we need to really think, well, how can we uh, make it work better? And um, you know, selective multilateralism, which is always an accusation uh, from, uh, that is lobbed, uh, lobbed at, at, at the United States, at China. I think that's always been the game, but we have to move, I think, to, to thinking more systematically in some ways about how this order uh, can work and thinking, it, thinking about it in the terms of, of, of R2C, of that, um, a responsibility to connect. So finding answers may also require sort of thinking of, about unconventional governance models, like thinking about, for example, the governance model that the World Economic Forum had offers, this kind of multi-stakeholder model, which brings in, you know, there's no state-to-state -state format, but maybe we have to think about um, willing coalitions of government, business, and civil society working together, that that's the way to keep the uh, international order uh, going. Um, to renew the global operating system, I propose sort of a concept of what I call essential multilateralism. We think we, we, we have to think of globalization as maybe having different lanes of participation. So different countries would be able to, to be in the fast lane, maybe the, the, the middle speed lane, and then the, the much slower lane. And, um, and also think about it uh, somewhat in the same vein that the current Biden, the Biden administration and uh, uh, President Biden and Secretary of State Blinken are thinking in their approach to China, that uh, and you know, as Biden said, you know, uh, the China-U.S. relationship will be competitive when it should be, collaborative when it can be, and adversarial when it must be. You know, that's a that's a, a, a has been his. Uh, a pledge of the government, and, and, and they, they seem to be trying to, to pursue that. If you think about uh, 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 John Kerry now, uh, the climate czar now being in China, to try to get um, uh, some competitive framework uh, going. Now, the dangers, I think, if we're, if we're confronted with this pandemic, which has washed away the tide, and we see it, it expose all the faults, um, the problems with the international order, I think the danger is trying to rebuild or revive a kind of liberal rules-based international order by, and, and this seems to be also what the Biden administration has in mind, by pitting democracies or the like-minded as often uh, used, the phrase used, against perceived adversaries. And I think this is what's going on in the Indo-Pacific and what I've been looking at uh, in, in recent months. The, the world is, I think, uh, you know, not, somehow trapped in a, a dream where suddenly you know we've woken up and uh, after Trump left and multilateralism was under the assault and but now now we're back to the operating in the way uh, we used to I think we need something new something to think about about what 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 multilateralism is essential uh, and and I don't think you can have um, say g7 countries working with, special invited democracies to create a D10 uh, and that that will make a, a new working order. So um, I would just close by saying, you know, I think that if we, if we think about multilateralism um, 
the essentials of it and the responsibility uh, that states have to connect their citizens to multilateral frameworks. I think this resonates in many ways with, with the current trend in thinking about foreign policy. Uh, and Biden talks about foreign policy for the middle class. I think in our, uh, the current government in Canada uh, talks about that too. Um, you know, it's, but I think it's crucial to pursue at this stage, particularly in light of what's been going on in the vaccine area and the pandemic and, and the failure of the global response um, to the pandemic, it's crucial to pursue more inclusive multilateralism and not to make the system, the international system work. This is the crunch time to make the international system work, to make it deliver for people. And so what it means for Canada, I think, is and other middle powers um, is to really be careful about our relationships and how you know the decisions that we make, um, because we're confronted in many ways with choices, one side or the other, and 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 we don't. I don't think we really want to do that. We want to be able to make choices according to our own interests and not whether um, it's going to be uh, possibly uh, be beneficial to the United States or it's what the United States want or it's what might be um, a way to challenge China. We also have to be realistic about the future. The center of economic gravity is shifting very much to the Asia Pacific. Uh, and I think our leaders, um, our leaders have the responsibility to connect us to that dynamic part of the world um, and not uh, pursue any sort of decoupling that I think is, um, is rather fanciful in any case. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alejandro, for your presentation. And, and thank you to all our speakers, to also to Rujan and Elizabeth. It was so interesting because although you are all working on distinct areas and the purpose of this evening's event was to hear from the CIC fellows, really a very clear theme emerged, which is that we're at a moment um, in history when we need collaboration and cooperation more than ever, and yet, we have uh, it. We have less of it than ever, or, or maybe that's a bit rhetorical. But you know, we have borders going up, as Elizabeth showed us. Um, we have countries not not sharing um, their vaccines, as as Rujan discussed. So, and yet we're in the midst of a crisis that um, requires cooperation if it's going to end, uh, as as Rujan explained with with the variants and, and how no one is safe from, from COVID uh, unless we're all safe from COVID. So we, we unfortunately have very little time for questions. We only have about um, six minutes because we're supposed to wrap up at what will be 9 p.m. over here. I'll ask the participants to please turn on their cameras and uh, indicate by raising your hand if you would like to ask a question. Uh, yes, John Tennant, please. I think this was uh, quite an exceptional uh, a range of discussions, but the one thing, and this is a selfish statement that really came through is inequality is an incredible issue today. It's probably the most notable societal political issue facing the world. Uh, Elizabeth certainly touched on this and we saw it with Virginia and uh, the national situation, uh, and it reflects in the global, of course, is very much the foundation of how we're going to need to go in the world. Uh, I'm making this uh, comment um, very selfishly because um, CIC has a very interesting and I think important event that we're just planning as uh, the CIC Waterloo branch with uh, support from an important uh, benefactor uh, in coming up uh, with a uh, major session. It'll be two days, three hours each, addressing inequality in Canada and the world. Income inequalities, the concentration of wealth, where technology change and jobs are having a big factor. And of course, uh, Elizabeth's highlighted the uh, borders. She's very much a part of this as a CIC fellow uh, on inequality. And I think we've heard this around that uh, this is a very, very key area. Uh, so I, I thank those that uh, spoke to it today. Uh, I really felt it come through. It came through as an important uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you.
on to that very quickly. Um, yeah, I, I would just say that uh, yeah, in, in terms of um, uh, what I would call sort of the essential multilateralism, I think that that is indeed inequality really a, a very important issue. Uh, but it, it hews to that idea that you know countries have to look at their own in their own garden. Il faut cultiver notre jardin. You know we have to cultivate our own garden first in order to then uh, be better able to interact with other countries and indeed address this problem. I, I think this is an important way of looking at foreign policy. You know how do you address inequalities at home and then uh, be able to cooperate to pursue inequalities uh, around the world. Um, and I think, of course, COVID has brought forward just <laughs> how much inequality has pervaded and made it an even more international issue. Um, okay, Christy Kenyon, please. Hi, I, I realized that we have three minutes remaining. Um, that was a, a, absolutely a fascinating presentation. Um, uh, I had questions for a question for each person. Um, um, I'm curious about, um, in, lo in looking at Elizabeth's presentation on borders, what you think of some of these new visa, visa regimes to facilitate um, basically the movement of the wealthy, so like Bermuda's uh, new visa. Um, Rugine, I was wondering if anybody, if there's been any conversation around Article 15 of the ICESCR and the right to benefit from scientific progress and whether that has come up around the issue of vaccine equity. Um, and Alejandro, um, my own research has looked at HIV and I was really struck by so many common parallels and this very powerful, Cuomo's powerful metaphor of the tide. And I'm wondering if, if it's an inherent quality of pandemics to reveal patterns of inequality, um, or if you think that there's any sort of structural differences we could make so that that isn't the outcome. I'm just going to ask Elizabeth to respond um, uh, first because she has to leave um, in two minutes. So, but, but the organizers have indicated that we can go past um, eight o'clock Winnipeg time. So uh, Elizabeth will answer and then we'll say goodbye to her and, and we could have a bit more time for the other responses. I apologize, family uh, duties. Um, um, thank you very much for, for your, your question. I do think that um, in looking into border regimes, we've been going through with my uh, research team through the, the border regimes and the way they have adapted to the pandemic. And you can tell that um, the pandemic and the sanitary reasons are being instrumentalized um, to, um, to deal with uh, issues that were pre-existent and the um, anti-migration uh, stance that we've seen across the world, um, the, the nationalistic and populist uh, trends that we've also, uh, we could also see before, um, before the, the pandemic have just been, uh, I, I, I've been mobilized, like the, the, the border regimes have been mobilized to, to uh, fulfill those uh, pre-existing uh, objectives. Um, so, um, and I was intending today, it's been a long day because the Association for Borderland Studies has, has its annual conference. So we've been um, talking since six, six o'clock this morning in Montreal. And uh, that's what everything comes back to that, uh, those border regimes uh, being instrumentalized and the way like any movement today and any variation in border regime uh, uh, is actually hiding uh, a more global or, or deeper um, uh, deeper objectives that uh, uh, precede the, the, the pandemic. So whatever visa regimes we are looking at, we have to see that, to, I think, to address that in terms of inequalities, but pre-existing inequalities that have been, um, that are, are going, um, or are increasing as we speak, and we can all speak about that, but definitely it's a tool in the hands of governments and it's not a sanitary one definitely it's political i apologize i need to run i'm so sorry but it's been a pleasure meeting you thank you very much thank you elizabeth thank you marina um so uh rujin do you want to go ahead and answer um the aspect of the question that um is kenyan directed to you sure sure um yeah so i uh 
I don't know for sure in which um, fora or in which uh, discussion tables, Article 15 of the right to benefit from uh, uh, scientific progress or from the right to benefit from scientific progress essentially is discussed. Um, I think that on the topic of the TRIPS waiver, so in the international pro intellectual property space, um, that's not necessarily the primary uh, vocabulary that's used or human rights is not, it, specific human rights as far as I understand are not the, pri the, the definite vocabulary, that, vocabulary that's used. It's also very much about urgency, this, this emergency, the state that we're in today, um, the, the, the exceptional nature of the circumstances and waiving the intellectual property rights until the pandemic ends. And so very much kind of a short-term temporary focus uh, as far as I've, uh, I, I've, I can recall. But I do know that, I mean, advocates do use this and, and there was actually a general comment uh, from the Committee on Economics, uh, Social and Cultural Rights uh, that clarified um, uh, the Article 15 of that covenant, um, just I think in April of last year. Uh, with regard to uh, Christy's question, thank you very much. Um, I think that there are opportunities for sure. It, 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 there's a book called The Great Leveler, which looks at uh, previous pandemics and the impact that um, they've had in terms of, uh, um, as the title suggests, uh, addressing inequalities in the world. And I think that that's kind of a, uh, it could be a, a phenomenon we see. I mean, if you think about the, the COVID response in the United States, I mean, with the uh, rescue plan that Biden administration passed, which uh, not only is it sort of direct uh, payments to um, households, individuals, um, but also uh, uh, efforts to reduce um, child poverty uh, in half in, 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 a, in the space of a year, which uh, you know, are, are very important um, aspects of trying to, you know, deal with inequality in the United States um, at, at a very fundamental level. And so I think, you, you know, uh, one would hope that this is, uh, the, 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 it's an indication of the kind of understanding that this could be an opportunity to address that challenge. Uh, I would, just as a caveat, if you go back to 1918, 19, um, the pandemic then, what did that lead to? It led to the Roaring Twenties, as it were, and then you know we know what the Roaring Twenties led to in terms of uh, the markets and uh, the depression. So, so uh, I, I would say that uh, you know it's a matter of of of, of getting focused, and 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 I, I I think it's important that you know reviving again multilateralism because we need to make it work now and work it work for. Um, middle-class people, for young people, for the elderly, for, for all sorts of people who are marginalized and disadvantaged. Uh, the Roaring Twenties are an interesting example, but do we come out of this more unequal? Uh, certainly uh, the last uh, downturn 10 years ago, that was the case. I think this is the problem. Have we, have we learned any lessons from, from that? Uh, I would say that the, um, the GFC, the global financial crisis was not as global as some might have thought, right? Uh, and, and that in fact, this is a, we're talking about globality, I mean, use that term, uh, on a very different scale with the pandemic rather than the, the, the so-called global financial crisis. But so we hope. Mm -hmm more widely pronounced this time. Right, I think that's true. Do we have any other questions? Okay, well, if there's no more questions, we, we will um, wrap it up only a, a few minutes behind schedule. So we've done very well. Um, I wanna thank the Canadian International Council Winnipeg branch for organizing this event and our three speakers for contributing really wonderful talks um, that give us an idea of what the CIC fellows are doing um, in their work. And um, I'll just maybe hand back to Robert uh, for any closing words. Thank you everyone for coming. Oh, thank you, Marina. Um, I'd like to thank Marina for uh, shepherding us through this, uh, this very interesting discussion this evening. Um, you folks are all doing fascinating work in very interesting and important areas of uh, of study these days and uh, 
really want to thank you for uh, taking the time out of your schedules to join us with and without little ones or with little ones hanging around in the background, et cetera, et cetera. It's, uh, it, it, I, think, uh, I think part of the benefit of going to the Zoom world in the last year is it's kind of humanized us a little bit more. Because this was a face-to-face -face event. First off, we wouldn't have everybody here because of distance and travel. Uh, but we also wouldn't have little ones in the background uh, creating uh, interesting encounters and experiences for the rest of us. So uh, we are going to run our next event in uh, June. And so hopefully uh, some, you, some of you will be able to join us then. And uh, I just want to remind you that uh, we have recorded this event. Uh, and I think it's going to, hopefully it'll have some legs as a YouTube recording on the uh, CIC YouTube webpage. Um, unless somebody has an objection to being uh, posted up. If there's no objections from the speakers or the participants that we will post this up and hopefully we'll reach a few more people than we're able to join us. And with that, I wanna thank Kowser for pulling this all together and organizing it. I know it's been a busy couple of months for Kowser and uh, the work and study he's been involved with. So I appreciate his efforts uh, uh, to make sure that our CIC events are still uh, still relevant and effective and, uh, and, and, and there to be had as our program chair. So uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, and I look forward to seeing you all again sometime. Thank you very much. Splendid evening. Thank you. Good evening.